Today we're going to be picking up in verse 27 through the, the remainder of the chapter. The last couple of times that I have been up here preaching, my objective was to, uh, to encourage you guys. And that, that's always my heart. I want to encourage you. And sometimes that may come by way of challenge. Um, and today, that's, that's more what this, this text is going to feel like. Uh, the last two sermons I did, I think one was the compassionate shepherd and the next one was the kindness of the Lord. And that's necessary because sometimes we need to just rest in the kindness of the Lord and, and just thank Him for the grace and, and the mercy that uh, we so uh, receive constantly. Uh, but today, this text is going to rub a little bit more. Occasionally, Jesus says things that are challenging, they're difficult, and they're meant to be. And I don't want to water that down. I don't want to soften the, the blow it's intended to have. And so that's, uh, that's kind of what's coming. And really, I've titled this sermon, Christianity According to Christ. And there's really three points, and that is, who is Jesus, what did He come to do, and what does He expect from us? So I hope that you'll kind of see that outline as we read through the text here. I'll read the text and then we'll pray. So picking up in verse 27 of Mark chapter 8. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road he asked his disciples saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah and others one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around, he looked at his disciples, and he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever des desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. And we are so grateful to be called your own. We are so blessed to be members of the body of Christ. And we are so thankful to be here today and to, to sing praise to your holy name and to read from your precious word and to, to hear from you. And that's my prayer, God. As I speak, may I be your mouthpiece. Would you speak through me? Would you bring your words to life? And would you cut, Lord, where we need to be cut? Would you heal where we need to be healed? May we be challenged. May we be encouraged. And I pray, Lord, that you be glorified above it all. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so as I said, there's really three main uh, groups of verses here. And I probably could have made a sermon out of each one of them, but I, I felt that it also flowed together really well. Who is Jesus? Why did he come? And what does he expect from us? And this is very important, and I'm sure that you understand that, particularly because a lot of people don't understand this. Within the church, many people have it wrong. They don't know who Jesus is. They certainly don't know why he came. And as a result, they really have no idea what is expected from them. And so this is super important. This is a message that is very near and dear to my heart. I understand the urgency of it. And I hope to communicate it with that same godly fear and trembling and urgency. So with that, let's move into it. Verse 27. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. 
And on the road, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? Okay, so at this point, they're in Caesarea Philippi, and I have a map. You guys know I love the maps. And uh, I think it's important to understand this. Um, It gives us some idea. It's kind of hard to see. I apologize for that. Um, But as I said, this is all of Israel right here, and there's basically three regions. And uh, the southernmost is Judea, then we have Samaria, and then we have Galilee. And a lot of Jesus' ministry centers around um, the Sea of Galilee there. Well, just in the last two chapters, uh, they set out from Gennesaret. They made their way up to Tyre and Sidon. You'll remember that was where Jesus encountered the, the Syrophoenician woman. You remember that? And so after that, they make their way over all the way down to the Decapolis. And that's where Jesus spit and touched the guy's tongue and his ears and and he restored his hearing and his speech and now they go all the way from Decapolis back up here to Caesarea Philippi so they're covering a lot of ground in just these two chapters so that gives us some understanding these things aren't necessarily happening back to back there is some time that elapses uh, between these accounts and it's interesting to me that these areas are predominantly Gentile territories Uh, A lot of idol worship, a lot of paganism, a lot of uh, Gentile um, areas, and and so that's where Jesus is at today. Very true of Caesarea Philippi. It was known for its Baal worship. Uh, There was a god there named Pan, the Greek god Pan, and also Caesar worship. Very prevalent there. So it's significant that Jesus would take his disciples there in that backdrop and say to them, Now who do men say that I am? He's in a place that is so well known for its idolatry and its pagan worship and Caesar worship. And the one true God, God in the flesh, is in their midst. And he's saying to them, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? And this is a very important question. As I said, it's one that we have to get right. There are a lot of people out there preaching a lot of false Christs. And that is deadly dangerous. Deadly dangerous. It's so important that we understand who the true Christ is. Salvation depends upon it. Eternal souls depend upon it. But so much of our interaction with with God, with Christ, depends upon a right understanding of who Jesus is. And so Jesus makes this very clear. And he asks the question, who do people say that I am? And there were various options that were given by the disciples. Uh, Verse 28, so they answered, John the Baptist Some say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. Now, something I want to mention, this account can also be found in Matthew, and the account in Matthew is far more detailed. So from time to time, I'll kind of bounce over and share a a few scriptures from Matthew that that parallel with this, that give a little bit of insight. But uh, they say John the Baptist, Elijah, prophets, there's all kinds of different ideas about who Jesus is. And I would say that not much has changed. Wouldn't you agree with that? There are still a lot of ideas and suggestions about who Jesus is. They're still saying, oh, he's, he's a prophet. He was just a prophet. Or he was a good man. He was a, a good teacher. Someone goes so far as to say he's a God. He's, he's a God among many gods. He's not the one true God, but he's a God. Some say that he's an archangel. Um, They don't really put that on Front Street too much, but they would say that Jesus was Michael. He became Jesus and went back to being Michael, an archangel. Some would say that that he was a spirit brother of Lucifer. It's it's pretty wild, some of the things that they come up with. And then, of course, some say simply a myth, nothing more. All of those are false, but those are all prevalent views out there, false ideas about Jesus. C.S. Lewis, uh, I like this, he said there's really only three legitimate options when we consider who Jesus is. When you take all the claims of Christ and you put them together, either he was a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. You understand that? Um, If he is Lord, if he's the Son of God, he's not all these lesser things. If he's a liar, then he's not good. He's not a good teacher. He's not a prophet. And if he's a lunatic, well, if he's out of his mind, then we know that everything that he said was was totally false and and coming from a a deranged mindset. So all these other options really don't pan out when you consider the, the Scriptures and what Jesus says of himself. Well, the good news is Peter got it right. 
Peter got it right. Verse 29 and 30, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. So Peter says, you're the Christ. In Matthew 16, 16, he adds to that, he says, you are the Son of the living God. So Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, Christ, Messiah, the Anointed One, that's, that's pretty much what it means. And this is very significant. So who is Jesus? He is the Christ. Okay, that's not his last name. I'm sure most of you know that. Uh, his name is Jesus, the son of Joseph. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. That has deep Old Testament implications. The nation of Israel had been looking for this foretold one, this one who would come in the name of the Lord, this anointed one, the one who would be sent of God. There were many prophecies in the Old Testament that foretold his coming and described what he would come to do. And it, it's kind of confusing because certain prophecies point to the fact that he would suffer and certain prophecies point to the fact that he would rule and that he would reign. So it's understandable how when Jesus came, uh, they were confused. That's, that's understandable. We, can't, we have the New Testament goggles. We have hindsight. We understand Jesus came the first time to save his people from their sins. He will return as the conquering king. Amen? Amen. All right, so that's, that's why he came. Now, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There's something very significant happening there. Notice that it says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And this is a prophecy of the Christ who was to come at a point in human history. He would be born into this world. A child would be born. That is the incarnation. But notice something slightly different follows that. A son will be given. The son of God who has preexisted from eternity past enters in to time and space through the incarnation, through childbirth. So a child is born and a son is given. Okay, And his name will be Wonderful, Counselor, and what? Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And this is Jesus. This is the one that the Old Testament foretold. And so when Peter says, you're the Christ the Son of the living God, they understood very well who He was and who He claimed to be and uh, who the, the, what the Bible had said the Messiah was. And that's very significant. we got to get that right. You have to get that right. Jesus is God Almighty. He is God in the flesh. He is the Son of God, second person of the Trinity. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. Jesus didn't deny it, did He? What did he say? His response was, don't tell anybody. He strictly warned them. So we're, we're kind of back to that again. You know, sometimes Jesus would say, go and tell. Sometimes he would say, don't tell. Uh, Jesus actually said in Matthew 16, verse 17, that this was a revelation from God. He tells Peter, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven revealed this to you. This was a revelation from God. And Peter's confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Get this, guys. This is the foundation upon which the church would be built. In this same text in Matthew chapter 16, I think we know the verse fairly well. Jesus says, and I say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So he says, I say to you that you're Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now a lot of people have taken that to mean that upon Peter the church would be built. Now that is absolutely false, and I'm so thankful that the church is not built upon Peter. We'd all be in a whole lot of trouble. All right, but the foundation upon which the church is built is that bedrock, that statement that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. That is the foundation of the church. We have come together in His name to worship Him, to praise Him, to honor His holy name, because He is the Christ. 
He is the Son of, living, of the living God. He alone brings salvation to the masses, and we've come to worship Him. He is the King. He is the Lord. And He is the foundation upon which the church is built. All right, so now that we understand, quick little overview of who Jesus is, why did He come? This is also very important because a lot of people seem to have this pretty twisted as well. So the real reason Jesus came, look at verse 31. He began to teach them and to say, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. So why did He come? To suffer many things? to be rejected, killed, and to rise again. The Son of Man came to die and to, to give His life for the sinful, for the lost. Uh, the Good Shepherd came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the reason that Jesus came. You understand that. We celebrate that. There are many implications. There are many blessings that flow out of that. But the reason that Jesus came was to save sinners from the wrath of Almighty God. And not only to save us from that wrath, but then to make us sons and daughters of the living God. So we're not just free from wrath and free from the bondage of sin, but now we enjoy a beautiful relationship with our Heavenly Father. And that's what the Son of God came to do. And to give us, to secure for us eternal life and paradise with Him and with the Father. Amen? That's why Jesus came. And He came to die. He came to give His life as a payment a propitiation, to atone, to be our substitute. He came to die in our place. He is our substitute. In John chapter 12, verse 27 and 28, in your notes, it says, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Jesus knew why he came. Over and over throughout the Gospels, he would say, it's not my hour. My hour has not come. My hour has not come. And finally, he says, it's here. The reason for which I came is here. My hour is here. And am I going to try to escape this? No, this is why I came. Father, glorify your name in this hour. Jesus came to die. He came to give his life as a sacrifice. The Old Testament made that crystal clear. Isaiah 53 uh, by His stripes, we are healed. And it pleased the Father to crush Him. That's so hard for us to understand. But it took that holy life to suffer and to die so that we unrighteous, wretched saints, not saints, we're saints now, sinners I should say, we're made saints. And it's clear. Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. Well, now Peter gets it wrong. Peter got it right, now Peter gets it wrong. Verse 32, he spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Matthew 16, 22 tells us what Peter actually said. Peter said, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. All right, so Peter's being bold He's kind of the hero here. He takes Jesus aside. He says, uh-uh, this isn't about to happen to you. And even though Jesus rebuked him, you'll recall, uh, he didn't give up, did he? What happened in the, the garden when Jesus was betrayed? He took one last stab at it, right? And he tried to get the guy with the sword, chop him in the head, I assume, and he missed and, and got his ear. Well, what's interesting here to me is that the disciples knew who Jesus was. Right? They knew who he was. God had revealed it to Peter. But they still didn't understand why he came. They still didn't understand why Jesus came. And they had a very man centered uh, idea. You know, Jesus came to overthrow Rome and to restore Israel back to glory, and the disciples wanted in on that. They wanted, they wanted to be on the front line, and they wanted to be seated with Jesus in glory when the, when the empire was restored. So they still didn't understand. They knew who he was. They didn't understand why he came. And, and may I suggest to you, this is still a problem, particularly in the church today. Churches that may know well who Jesus is still seem to have a misunderstanding of why he came. 
And I don't want to go too far into that right now. Here in a couple minutes, I'll hit on that a little bit more. But uh, we can come up with all kinds of reasons to try to sell Jesus and tell people why Jesus came. And some of them may be legitimate in a sense. They may be blessings that we experience uh, as a result of him coming, but that's not why he came necessarily. So what was Jesus' response? Verse 33, But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. This is strong language. This is shocking. He looks at Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. Imagine that, right? So one of the things that kind of stood out to me, I had to ask the question, was Peter actually indwelt by Satan, you think? It doesn't indicate that here. We know that Judas was actually indwelt by Satan. It tells us, us that in Luke 22, 3 that Judas was indwelt by Satan and he went off to betray Christ. I don't think that's what, I, I'm certain that's not what happened here. But Jesus may have discerned that Peter was being manipulated. Peter was being manipulated by, by Satan to try to hinder the work of God. Jesus may have simply been implying that, you know, Peter, you're doing the work of the enemy for him, frankly. Uh, I had a, a good buddy that just would beat himself up so bad all the time. I mean, he would just condemnation, guilt, shame all the time. And I remember thinking, man, this guy doesn't even need the enemy to mess with him. He's doing his job for him. It's nothing but condemnation and guilt all the time. We can do that sometimes. And so in a sense, I think it, Jesus could just be simply implying, you know, you're doing the work of the devil for him. You know, get out of Stop trying to hinder God's work. You're not mindful of the things of God, but of men. And that's what Jesus accused Peter of. You're not being mindful of the things of God, Peter, but the things of men. Okay? You've got a misunderstanding, a misperception of the work of God here. And may I just say, in keeping with this idea of um, a misunderstanding of who Jesus is and why Jesus came, uh, I, I think one of the, the predominant issues facing our church today is that it's all about us. Would you agree with that? It's all about us. It's, it's very humanistic. And so Jesus came to give us a better life. Jesus came to me, 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 fill in the blank. Jesus came to take away fear or take away shame or fill in the blank. And some of those things can be uh, in results. But that's not necessarily why Jesus came. And when we make it all about us, you know what we're being mindful of? The things of man. We're not being mindful of the things of God because we're making it all about us when it's not. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So moving into the next, what does Jesus expect? What does Jesus expect? This is where it really starts getting challenging. And I, I like these kinds of texts, guys. Um, you know, I like it when I get my feet stepped on a little bit. Don't you? Um, it makes me feel alive a little bit. When I get convicted, I'm like, the Spirit of God is in me, and, and I, the Lord is speaking to me, and, and, you know, thank you, Lord. It doesn't feel great, but it, it is encouraging. So having said that, verse 34, when he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So now Jesus is talking to the whole crowd. He was talking to his disciples, and now he's turning his attention to the whole crowd. Jesus was never really impressed with large crowds. I think he was more suspicious than anything. And Jesus never watered down his message. He never softened uh, the, his demands in order to keep the crowds. In fact, at times it seemed as if Jesus was actually trying to talk the crowds out of following him. You know, he would say, are you sure you guys are, are here for the right reason? I mean, maybe you're just following me because you ate the bread and the fish and you, you, were, you were full. I don't, I don't know if you guys are really salt. Maybe you're flavorless salt. I don't really know if you're the real thing. Maybe you should count the cost. You know, uh, it, it's like a man who was going to build a tower and he had to sit down and decide, do I have the money to build a tower? And no, he didn't, so he didn't build it. He didn't have 
what it took to build it so he didn't build. Or it's like someone going to war. He uses these kinds of illustrations there in Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 35. Jesus really told people, are you sure that you want to follow me? Do you understand what this could cost you? Have you counted the cost? And that was Jesus' approach. And so he didn't water it down. He didn't soften the, the, as I said, the blow it was intended to have. And I, I don't want to do that either. So Jesus said that if you want to follow me, if you want to serve me, if you want to be a Christian, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So I want to consider what that means. Jesus says you have to deny yourself. Now let me start by saying this, guys. We're blessed. Are we blessed? We're a blessed people. We are a God-blessed nation, and we enjoy many freedoms and, and uh, wonderful things. And I'm not uh, trying to lay a guilt trip on anybody for the things that we enjoy. I believe that many of our brothers and sisters around the world would love to have the freedoms and, and the things that, that we enjoy. And so we praise God for those things. We, we recognize that God is the giver of all good gifts, and we're blessed to be in this country and to enjoy the freedom that we have. But we don't live for those things. We don't spend all our life, all our energy laboring after things, things that are really very secondary, right? That's not what it's all about. We don't live for luxuries. We don't live for self-gratification, for self-preservation, um, self-promotion. I really feel like that's something that we see happening in the church today, this self-promotion. We're all called to do big things. We're all called to go places. Somehow we're all leaders. Everyone's a leader. We're all leaders. And it's just it's such a bizarre thing. And people like that. It's appealing, very appealing. And they're lining up for it. Um, but Jesus says we're to deny ourselves and we're to take up our cross. So what does it mean to deny ourselves simply? In, in, a, in a general sense, uh, it's... Not my will, right? Not my will. Whose will? His will be done. His heart, His purposes, His plans, His glory. That's what we're living for. Because we have goals, don't we? We have dreams. We have desires. We have plans, big plans, right? But Jesus says, maybe your plans are not my plans, Maybe my ways are higher than your ways. I remember when I first came to Christ, there was this corny little line. They would say, if you want to make God laugh, tell Him your plans. And I, I liked that. And that was interesting to me, something I had never considered. God has a plan. God has a purpose for my life, and it's so much better than anything I could dream up. That's always been appealing to me. And that's what it's all about. So you might need to check that. You might need to deny yourself because maybe it's not about you. It's about Him and His plan, His purpose, His glory. Deny yourself. And at times, it may look like, so let's just get a little more practical here, denying oneself could be stepping out in faith, taking such a serious step of faith that it takes you out of your comfort zone. We like comfort, don't we? Comfort feels good. And we, we live for that, we work hard for that, we do everything in our power to get that. But God might be calling you out of that. God might be calling you to take a serious step of faith, to deny yourself comfort, to deny yourself security, and to step out. Deny yourself that. Take a serious step of faith. Put yourself in a position where you really are dependent upon the Lord, where if He doesn't show up, then the bottom's really going to fall out of this thing. Maybe he's calling you to deny yourself and love people. Love someone that hates you. You ever thought about that? Love people that hate you. Isn't that what Jesus did? Deny yourself. Maybe he's telling you don't retaliate when someone berates you or slanders you. Don't defend yourself. Did he? Did he defend himself, Jesus? No, not at all. Maybe he's saying you should deny yourself and serve somebody even when it's inconvenient. Even when it costs you something. Even when you don't get any recognition for it. Maybe you should deny yourself and serve the Lord. 
How about giving sacrificially? Giving sacrificially. It's not something that we talk about an awful lot in this church, and we did sometime back as we were going through 2 Corinthians. When it comes up in the Scriptures, we really go there. But this is one of the ways in which we, we worship the Lord. We give. We give to support the work of the kingdom. And we give sacrificially. That, that's what counts to the Lord. It's not the size of the gift. It's how much it costs you. And we're called to give sacrificially. And I, I want to just say at this moment, at this point, get a little more practical. We have a family in this church that we're getting ready to send out, the Mosleys. I think most all of you in here know them. And they're going to be leaving in about a month to go out to Mexico. And they're taking their, their children with them. And we're very proud of them. And this is a, a marvelous thing that the Lord is doing right here in the midst of our assembly. And we want to get behind them and we want to support them in that. Amen? And we're going to do that. Our church will, uh, will certainly support them. And in a couple of weeks, they're going to come up here and they're going to share with us in detail uh, what that looks like, what the plan is, what, what they think God is calling them specifically to do, what that's going to look like, when, what their needs are. And I want to challenge you guys. Deny yourself and, and support them. Support the body and kingdom work. Consider how you individually can give. You know, you guys can support our missionaries. Um, I know a lot of you give uh, to the church generally, and that's fantastic. Praise the Lord. But I want to encourage you guys to prayerfully consider supporting missionaries, and particularly the Mosleys, as we send them out. This is what it's all about. The church doing the kingdom work and sending people out around the world to preach the gospel, to seek and save the lost. And so we deny ourselves, we give sacrificially, and that's an excellent way in which you can do that. I want to encourage you to be praying and thinking about that. Um, leading up to when they come up and kind of give us some, some specifics. And then lastly, really the ultimate is suffering. This is something we don't know a lot about, uh, suffering for the gospel. Some people even called to give their lives for the gospel around the world. Uh, but this is, this is a way in which people are called to deny themselves. Jesus says, take up your cross. Take up your cross. Do you understand the cross was a grotesque, hideous thing? It was not even to be mentioned in public, social settings. You just don't talk about that. This is something that they saw all the time, and they understood how horrific the cross was. It's not a good luck charm. It's not a decorative emblem like we see everywhere. It was an instrument of execution, of torture. And I love what A.W. Tozer said about the cross. There's one thing you knew about a man carrying a cross outside the city. You know what that is? He ain't coming back. He's not. He will be nailed to that thing and he won't come off until he's dead. And that's what the cross represents. And have you heard people say, well, that's just my cross to bear? You ever heard that? I guess that's just my cross to bear. Maybe they're having a challenge in their marriage or you fill in the blank. That, but that's, that's not accurate. That's a burden. And we all have burdens. And the Bible says that we ought to cast our burdens upon the Lord. Amen? But that's not the same thing as a cross. A cross is something we take up and we die. We deny ourselves. We die on that cross, and it's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. I have been crucified. You understand? Galatians says, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has died to me and I to the world. That's what a cross represents. So when Jesus says, deny yourself, he's saying, it ain't about me, it ain't about you, it's about him. Take up the cross. I'm dead. Rob is dead. Rob no longer lives. Christ lives in me, and now I live for the glory of his name and for his purpose and his will in my life. So not every Christian would literally be crucified. Several of those disciples that he was talking to would be. They would take up their crosses. They would die. And that's not a call to every Christian, obviously. Many of us are called to live for Christ. Some are called to die. Many are called to live. And we're to be living sacrifices. And the Bible says that we who have been baptized into Jesus' death have risen again into the newness of life. Our old man has been crucified with Christ, and we have risen again, and now we are dead to sin, and we are alive to God in Christ Jesus. So we identify with Jesus through the cross. Is that true of you, Christian? 
When's the last time you denied yourself? When is the last time you took up your cross and died? And then Jesus says, follow me. This was a common invitation given by Jesus to potential disciples. To follow Jesus. I think this is a better term than Christian. Christian means a lot of different things now, nowadays. And I think a follower more specifically describes what we are. We, we follow Jesus. We walk with Him. We, we imitate Him. We obey His commands. We want to look like Him. We follow Him. And Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you have to take up your cross. You have to deny yourself. But this was the invitation that he often gave to those potential disciples. Following Christ often came at a cost. It often came at a cost. There's some scriptures I have there for you. I would encourage you to look those up. Uh, it often came at a cost. I won't go into these. I just want to mention the, you know, the rich young ruler. We all know that story, right? You remember he told him to sell all that he has, give it to the poor, follow me. And we all kind of <gasps> gasp a little bit when we read that. And we think, would Jesus really call everyone to sell everything that they own and, and follow him? And I would say to you, no, that's not what Jesus is saying. He's not telling every single person to sell everything that they own and follow him. But I love this. I heard a pastor say one time, even though that's the case, if that causes you to breathe a little easier, then you're probably the one to whom Jesus would be saying that. You know? And so it's just something to consider. I'm not telling anyone to sell everything, all right? But... I don't want to lighten the blow that that's intended to have. Jesus may be telling someone in here to sell everything that they have and follow him. All right, the grand reversal. We're going to speed up now, all right? Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Jesus uses this kind of language frequently. The first will be last. The, the least shall be the greatest. Uh, this really speaks of the difference between God's economy and man's economy. Man, man and God quite different in the way that they think. And, um, you know, man says, he who dies with the most toys wins. And God says, store up your treasures in heaven where moth cannot eat it, rust can't destroy, thieves can't steal. Um, man says, get to the top. Whatever it takes, whoever you got to step on to get there. But the Bible, God says, esteem others greater than yourself. Humble yourselves. Look out for the interest of other people. So we see that it's very different. And Jesus says that if you want to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you're willing to lose your life for my sake and for the gospel, you'll find life. You'll save it. Saving one's life means self-preservation at any cost. Um, over obedience, over servitude to the Lord, any, any of that. Remember, I was talking with uh, Pastor Bill way back when, before I even moved out here. We were going to go to Mexico, and there were a number of people who didn't want to go. They were scared. And, you know, you hear all these things and afraid of danger. And I was telling Pastor Bill about that, and he said, Oh, they want to save their lives. And it just clicked. And I was like, that's, yeah, that's exactly what, uh, what, what Jesus meant. You want to save your life? You can't. You're going to lose it. There's freedom in just letting it go and denying yourself and entrusting yourself to the Lord. Jim Elliott said he is no fool who gives away what he cannot keep in order to gain that what, which he cannot lose. I love that quote. All right, called to prioritize. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Is it really worth having your so-called best life now in the end is it really worth it is that what we're living for is that what we really want um, we can spend our whole lives preserving self gratifying self promoting self but what's going to happen when we stand before the righteous judge and we're called in to uh, give an account for how we used the time that he gave us the, the finances that he gave us, the giftings that he gave us. When we stand before the Lord and we have to admit that we used all that for self, we don't want to be in that place, do we? That's serious. Take that into consideration. And then lastly, a sobering warning, verse 38. 
For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man, will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Let this be a warning, guys. We live in an adulterous and sinful society, do we not? And we can easily be intimidated, made to feel ignorant, or even embarrassed about the things that we believe, the convictions that we hold. Don't do that. Don't do that. Be bold. Be bold for the Lord. Don't be ashamed of our Lord. Don't give in to that. Because Jesus said, those who are ashamed of me, I'm going to be ashamed of them when I come with my Father and the holy angels. We don't want to hear that. You know what we want to hear? Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful. That's what we want to hear. Amen? So, who is Jesus? He's the Christ. Why did He come? To suffer, to die, to rise again, to seek and save the lost. What does He expect? That we deny ourselves, take up our cross, follow Him, that we be good and faithful servants. Amen? Amen. So we're going to close. I'm going to pray for us. If there's anybody who would like any prayer, if you want to respond, you're certainly welcome to do that. We'll have people up here who will pray for you. So let's all right, yeah, thank you for reminding me of that. I'll pray for the fathers. All right, Heavenly Father, we love you, and we, we praise you. And I, I thank you for the, the fathers here in this assembly and throughout Napa and the other churches. And I pray a special blessing upon those brothers today as we uh, gather separately as families to celebrate dads. And uh, I pray that you would encourage these men, encourage them to stay the course, to be men who model denying oneself and serving you, Lord, and taking up their cross. And uh, this is not an easy job. It's a very difficult thing at times, leading the family. And I pray that you would bless these fathers, bless these men, that they would stay the course, that they would lead and love their families in the name of Jesus. And I thank you for the service, Lord. I thank you for the word that was preached. I pray that it had a great effect upon the hearers and that you were glorified, Father. And I pray that they would take these things, including myself, and that uh, we would walk these things out. In Jesus' name, amen.